And uh, our last speaker for the day is Harold Dedman. And Harold is a forensic exa examiner in the Trace Evidence Unit at the Metropolitan Police Department in the Crime Lab in Lorton, Virginia. And I think we may see some more probability things here. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that was started at George Washington University where I, where I teach uh, in the spring semester. And uh, the two names up there are two graduate students that, that uh, worked with me on this project. And it's an attempt to get some information that, that can help in evaluating what the fiber evidence means when you make an association, when you match fibers to a particular source. The, um, I think that's a big question. One of the uh, slides that I use in my, in my trace evidence class at George Washington, I, I list a number of responsibilities of the trace analyst. And this is the first of two slides containing different responsibilities. But I think it's important for the expert witness to testify to the significance of the matching evidence. In other words, you match something up, you match a fiber to a particular source, what does it mean? I don't think you can leave that to the jury. They may not believe you, but I think you need to tell them what it means. And you also need to provide a foundation for whatever your interpretation is or whatever your opinion is. And so this study was, was set up to, to try to get some information uh, that would be helpful in assessing the significance of matching evidence. Uh, the NSA NAS report that uh, has been brought up a number of times also includes uh, something that uh, I assume applies to both to testimony as well as the reports. In other words, they want a measure of uncertainty in your results. Well, I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to do that with fibers, except maybe in a qualitative sense. But um, it seems like DNA stands alone. We can come up with what they call a random match probability. And that's the way I titled this talk in my abstract, although the more I thought about it, uh, it's not in the random match probability that I that was talking about was not the same as with DNA. So I think I probably titled my abstract incorrectly. Um, the random match probability with DNA is equivalent to the frequency of occurrence of a DNA type in the population. It's also equivalent to the probability of a coincidental match, the probability of selecting someone at random who has the same DNA type in a population of unrelated people. And I'm not sure, quite sure that what I'm generating, what I'm trying to generate in this, in this study is the same thing. Uh, but I'm trying to generate a number that, that can be used to, to uh, demonstrate the variety that exists in carpet fibers and, and also how unlikely it is to obtain a coincidental match. Um, I think those of us in the fiber community are lucky because there's a lot in the literature that we can base our, our conclusions on our interpretation. I mean, I believe that a match, a fiber match, as long as it's not a common fiber, is a meaningful association and the chance of a coincidental match is very small. And I'm basing this not only on my experience, but the many target fiber studies that have been published, the population studies, and the blocks of color studies. And what I'm doing in this, in this uh, project was something similar to a block of color study. I'm collecting a lot of samples, and I'm comparing, trying to compare each sample with every other sample, which is what has been done in some of the blocks of color studies uh, that have come out of, I think, England or Germany, where they've, for instance, collected hundreds of blue polyesters and then compare each one with every other one and find out how many matches they obtain by chance. Um, and there's an awful lot in the literature. Uh, these are quotes from one of Mike Greaves' chapters uh, in one of the fiber books uh, that, that basically I can rely on because they are published in the literature. And, and they're consistent with my, my experience and the studies that I've done uh, either in the FBI or, or in, at GW, that the chance of finding a particular uh, fiber type by chance is very small if it's, not a, if it's not a common fiber. I don't know if we'll ever be able to put a number to that. We probably won't. But, but these are things that are in the literature, and I think, I think fiber examiners can rely on them. And then if you can identify something uncommon about a fiber, you could, it, can, it can lower the probability of a coincidental match. Uh, Barry Godet many years ago wrote a paper where he, looked about, he talks about evaluating associative evidence. And, 
the first thing he talks about is what's the probability that the match you've made is due to coincidence. And then there are these other things which, which you also have to consider. You know, what is the chance that someone's made a mistake? You know, in terms of there may be other explanations for the fiber transfer which, which, uh, which you have to consider or the investigators have to consider. This is what the project was. Basically, uh, three of us went into a junkyard in Northern Virginia and collected 200 carpet samples. We selected the vehicles at random from about 2,000 cars in the database or in the, in the junkyard. Um, it was interesting because they really turned these cars over fast in the junkyard. So we, we sorted it, we selected 200 at random using a random number generator. By the time we got to some of the cars, they were gone. They had been trashed or junked or whatever. They, they, they scrap them and send them off to, uh, uh, to the metal yard, I guess, to use the scrap metal. But anyway, we also found out that they didn't put the cars into the junkyard based on any rhyme or reason. As the place opened up, they stuck a car in there, the next car that came in. And so we kind of used some fibers that, or car carpets that weren't selected at random uh, by just selecting the cars at the end of a row and then using some of those for our database. Anyway, we collected uh, a total of 200 cars. This was the first page of the list of cars that the, I think it was Greenleaf Junkyard, it's owned by Ford. Uh, so they have all these cars and they also had a location in the junkyard that we could go and try to find the car. And so this was the list that we, that we used the random number generator to select our 200 cars from. This is one page of maybe 20 pages um, these were the cars we selected. Now, I have the IN numbers for some of them. That's important because I can determine if they were manufactured in the same plant. Um, you know, I have the type and the year. I, I can determine if they're manufactured by the same company and so forth. So this is a portion of the 200 cars. As, you, as most of you are aware, most of the carpet fibers are nylon. Most are trilobal. There are some round ones. But the trilobal comes in various shapes. Um, I didn't take cross sections, and uh, I think in most cases where I have a carpet fiber association, I would take a cross section because there's always a chance you're going to identify a fiber as being, you know, an, an old fiber or one that was manufactured many years ago, especially if it's kind of an oddball cross section. I'd like to take cross sections in some of these, but um, the other problem was that most fibers were really lightly dyed. If you're familiar with automobile carpet, they're either some shade of gray or some shade of black. Of the 200 samples, only three were a colored carpet, like red or, or dark blue or something like that. And when you get down to the individual fiber, if you have a brown carpet, the individual fiber is not gonna have very much dye. And I had some classes when I tried to set up the database that had 30 or 40 fibers in it that were, they all look the same under the microscope. And we rely a lot on microscopic analysis. The comparison microscope is very discriminating if you have some dye present. If you don't have a dye present, then, then you know, you have to worry a little bit. Um, I gave these, these uh, 200 samples to the students. We classified them based on various things that I'll talk about. And then some, the two graduate students started looking at them with a comparison scope. And they couldn't, they couldn't separate them out because a lot of fibers were colorless, they had no dye, uh, the cross sections were the same, they couldn't really sort them out. So I ended up doing spectrophotometry on them. So it's been a couple years since this project was first started, but I've, I've attained 200 absorption curves or actually more than that on these fibers. This is an example of, of what most of the fibers look like. And this is using a craic where the center curve is the average of five to 10, 10 spectral curves. Then we have one standard deviation, plus or minus, two standard deviations, plus or minus. And I'm trying to figure out a way, and I don't know if there is a way, to use absorbance values in a database. Um, I don't know if somebody has a good suggestion. Uh, I have a lot of absorbance values that uh, I could put in a database. But this is a typical curve, and this is what you'd like to see where the two, minus two standard deviation curve looks very similar to the upper curve. Um, I ran a bunch of duplicates, and uh, these were samples that I ran at different times. 
the same sample. I'm not necessarily looking at the same fibers, but I'm, I'm looking at fibers in the same general part of the slide. Um, but the orientation of the fibers is probably not going to be exactly the same. So these are absorbance values at 405, at 600, and, and, and near the end at 795. I was running these curves from 400 to 700, or 400 to 800. And I, I don't know, some of them are very similar, the values, some of them aren't so similar. And uh, I, I eventually did not use absorbance values in, a data, in the database I created, and, and I don't know if one can use these values. Uh, these are two fibers, these are two duplicates that I ran. Um, and you can see they're very similar in, in, in terms of shape. Uh, this is another duplicate that's not quite as similar, but most of the duplicates uh, on the absorption curves were very similar. So the shape of the curve was, was, uh, was going to be fairly constant. Uh, I used a, an old FileMaker Pro software program to try to create a database. The problem is when you're dealing with lightly colored fibers, you're making it, always making a kind of a subjective analysis of, of where a particular fiber goes. Uh, when you get a light brown fiber and you have very little dye present or a light gray fiber, sometimes it's hard to decide which category it goes into. Um, the other problem is, and this is a problem when you conduct a study of this type, is that you know that every match you make is going to reduce the significance of fiber evidence that comes out of your study. It's kind of like the, the, the Gaudet study many years ago with hairs. One of the problems was every match he made uh, it essentially reduces the value of the, of the hair evidence. And so he was criticized because you know, he knew that when he was doing his comparisons. And the same thing applies here. Every, every association I make uh, is going to make fiber evidence more common. It's more likely a coincidental match and so forth. Um, Anyway, I decided to, to base, without taking cross-sections, to try and separate the, a database into classes based on color, cross-section, delustrant. I didn't use absorbance. Um, so there is some subjectivity involved in deciding when you have a colorless fiber versus a, a light gray fiber or a light brown fiber. Um, I tried to determine cross-section based on the longitudinal mount. I didn't take cross-sections. Michelin man's fairly easy, round's easy, regular's fairly easy, irregular is where you have a cross section that, that uh, well, I'll give you some examples here. This would be a regular cross section where all the lobes are exactly the same and they're all, they don't have any protrusions or, or they're not bent in a particular way. This would be an irregular cross section. And normally you can tell the difference when you have an irregular or irregular by looking at the, um, looking at the long longitudinal uh, fiber. Uh, even though this is a symmetrical, all the lobes are the same, I consider this irregular because I could determine that it's not similar to that first class that I showed. Anyway, that's how I classified the fibers. And I, I'm thinking of going back and looking at my classification in terms of color and cross-sectional shape uh, as to how well I did. I came up with about 20 matches, although I believe this is kind of a conservative estimate, but I based it primarily on microscopy. I took a class from the database and then uh, looked at the fibers and also did spectrophotometry on the fibers. So if, if you use this as a, as, a, as a measure of the random match probability, it's about one in a thousand. I need to go back and, and, and do a lot more because I'm basing this strictly on microscopy and spectrophotometry. Um, so these are just some of the issues, some of the problems that, that occur in a study like this. Uh, most of the samples are either gray or, or brown, and there's an awful lot of really lightly colored fibers. Uh, the carpet may be a beige or a light brown. The fiber is not going to show hardly any dye if you see anything at all. Uh, the comparison microscope was not very helpful. Now, normally with fibers, as I said, it, it, my experience is very discriminating. There's not much dye. You need to conduct spectrophotometry. Um, a large number of lightly dyed fibers are going to have the same cross-sectional shape. Uh, uh, the worst category is Michelin Man, where you're dealing with, with the same fiber type, uh, the same size fiber. And, and I had, I, th I think, like 32 colorless Michelin Man. Um, 
Anyway, there's also a lot of variation in the absorption curves. Uh, I showed you an example of what you'd like to see with absorption curves, where the shape of, the, of all the curves were pretty much the same, but I had a number of examples where the shapes were not the same. Uh, this is Michelin Man longitudinal mount. Uh, fairly easy to classify as Michelin Man, but I had 32 fibers in the, in the category of colorless Michelin Man. And spectrophotometry was extremely good at sorting them out, but you still uh, have to worry. So some of these other techniques that have been discussed uh, today uh, would be really helpful for these lightly dyed fibers. I used a very crude technique. I, I took a lot of fibers in the same class, ran a lot of curves, and then tried to separate them into categories based on their curves. So this is regular trilobal delustered nylon. Um, I forget how many were in this category. I think this is just a subset of those. But I'm not sure how good a job I did in terms of separating these into groups. I would narrow these down, erase some. It's great with a Cray spectrophotometer because you, s you have all the data so you can bring up whatever you want. Uh, this, this is just an example of a regular trilobal. I would find a number of, of fibers where I could see that the center lobe was the same size, uh, maybe five four or five images like the, the image that's east-west up there. Um, and I think it's fairly easy to classify fiber. I did some studies, though, to see well, how much variation I would get. This is a round, white polyester fiber. And I had the measuring area of the spectrophotometer in the center of the fiber. And so you wouldn't expect to see a lot of variation. But as you can see, there is what I see, think is a lot of variation there. So I don't know if, if, if the level of, if the depth of field or if the, if the focus point is what's causing this. But anyway, I'd like to look at, at, at orientation problems, although I tried to eliminate orientation factors by using round fibers here. Uh, I threw this in because there was a lot of talk yesterday in the statistics conference about bias. And I don't have the reference to this paper, but there's a paper that talks about contextual bias and then there are these two other biases that they talk about. Um, a bias towards producing a positive outcome, and then in, in an adversarial system, trying to, trying to basically please the people you're working for. And so I think this is something we all have to be careful of. Um, this is a typical procedure that I use in a fiber comparison. Um, comparison microscope, polarized light microscope, fluorescent microscopy. Um, microspectrophotometry and FTIR. I don't know if some of the additional, if the FTIR would add additional discrimination. Um, fluorescent microscopy would probably add a little bit. Um, and this is something that I'm going to try to continue on, especially with the, the fibers that I've associated. Um, this is a little bit about future work. I need to go back. I haven't done this yet, and I should have done it, where I need to compare the fibers that I've matched up. I need to find out what cars they've come from, what plants they were manufactured in, and so forth. The other comparison procedures would be the FTIR. Um, I'm not sure how much discrimination would be. People I've talked to in the FBI think that there might be more discrimination from FTR than I think uh, would occur. It might be useful to look at the, the cross-sections in more detail. Um, and certainly, uh, some of the procedures used over in England and Germany, microspectrophotometry down in the UV range, first derivative analysis, might be very helpful with, um, with these fibers, especially the lightly dyed ones. Um, there have been a number of talks uh, at this particular meeting that I'm sure would be helpful. Uh, they're not standard procedures used by crime laboratories at the present time, but very likely that some of them will come into play in the near future. So I think I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions now for the panel. And the one, the one caveat is that we have a microphone that's all the way up here. So we've been asked to make sure that you speak loudly enough so that whoever's watching this by the streaming technique uh, can hear us. So, you have observation for Hal actually. Um, sorry, my speaker. Yeah. 
Um, just to pick up what you said there, Hal, about use of the uh, UV microspectrophotometry in the first derivative. Uh, from the way you described your work, I think it would be really useful uh, because certainly the experience we've had with UV MSP is it looks at different, gives you different information perhaps about mm -hmm. finishes on the fiber, chemical treatments, that sort of thing, which would be potentially very useful for. Uh, as yeah, Ray's, Ray's comment. Ray's comment was that he thinks that, that, that especially UV spectrophotometry would be extremely helpful, especially with the lightly dyed fibers. And so that's something I know the FBI is looking at, and I'm waiting for them to validate the procedure. But it is something that the Craig spectrophotometer can do, so it's something that I could look at quite easily. I think also the, the first derivative is very helpful. The and the first derivative, too. Do, is there a reason that you would pick only the first derivative and not the second? Yeah, we, we did a, a, quite a, an involved study looking at different parameters and, and derivatization spectrum. <coughs> the problem with second derivative is that you start bringing noise into the equation, and it makes it quite uh, difficult to, to interpret. So we tend to only use the first derivative. Okay. Uh, Ray's comment is that the uh, first derivative they found in studies to be quite useful, and that Second derivative, you start to bring noise into the, into the, uh, I guess the results, and it's not as useful based on their study. Yeah, are there other questions? We can't let this panel go away without some more questions. Yeah. Yes. How is what I've never heard the term Michelin Man described for a <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you had a trilobal. So is it just a deviation of a trilobal? Yeah, Michelin Man is a particular type of trilobal. If you can ma imagine the Michelin Man character on TV commercials, it's kind of like that. He has, it's, I should have had, I should have inclu included the cross section of it, but if you, if you look at fibers, it has a distinct cross section, and uh, it's different from any other cross section I've ever seen. Yes, sir. I actually had a question about the uh, book of the fabrics. Um, in the paint world, there is refinished books, and the refinished colors are not the actual same chemistry as what was applied to the vehicles. Are those at the actual dyes that were used in those vehicles? And if so, what does the location, the regional locations of the plants mean in what dyes they might choose. Is that something that's set? All, all the fabrics going into these vehicles are gonna be using this dye. Right, great question. Um, I didn't have a chance to get into that, but um, we don't know the answer to some of that. Um, one of the things that we know is that the automobile, automobile industry, uh, they have uh, usually uh, one or perhaps two suppliers. Uh, and they'll, they'll specify um, light specifications of f light fastness and things like that. It's possible that one of these samples uh, are coming from a particular source that may be, there may be another source for the same um, product, so the same F-150, for example, and that's one thing that we're trying to get a uh, handle on. It's qu at the same time, it's quite possible that um, even if they're uh, manufactured at different plants, they will use the same dyes. There's actually very few um, automotive uh, uh, dyes that are used because of light fastness requirements. And so uh, that's something that we're going to build out. I think it's a, it's a great question. So it is a, it is a question of concern. But, but still, um, uh, I think it's, there's a lot of optimism, I think, for us. The automobile manufacturers specify a color. The fabric manufacturer is the one that says, OK, I'm going to use these dyes to make that color. And very often what they do is because you want an automotive fabric, which is probably going to fade, you want it to fade on tone so it just gets lighter in color. You don't want a, a nice color to go to some ugly color when it fades. So sometimes what they will do, they'll do a couple of things to minimize that. They build in redundancy in the dye. So sometimes there will be two dyes that have very similar hues and spectral characteristics. And of course, they put in uh, UV absorbers in the fibers to help uh, minimize the, uh, the degradation of the dyes. My fear is that those samples are not 
the same. They're not as production, right? Yeah. And they're not, they don't have the same requirements. Those are in a closed book in somebody's lab or university versus out out in the in the vehicle. And so, as long as that color looks about like the color that was used in the vehicle, maybe they're just trying to show you what that color would be similar to versus the actual chemistry of. One of the ways to answer that is for us to do what they do with PDQ, and that's to get our students to go out to the junkyard and get some of these, yeah. these fabrics and bring them in and then extract them and see what the dye distribution looks like. While they're there, they can just go ahead and collect the paint. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a good idea. Yeah. In fact, you know, the problem, the problem with going to junkyards is that they're throwing away all their old cars. And so this junkyard was really up to date, and I think it was from... The oldest car they had was 1993, and I think the newest was 2005. So it's hard to get old old car samples. Right, right. And we actually have students doing that right as today. In fact, uh, collecting samples. And one of the things we've told them to do is to collect multiple samples. And and the cleanest part of it. Let's say you've got a relatively old car. Mm -hmm. Get it from underneath the seat or something like that. It's not been exposed to light. Probably not been soiled that much. Um, and then also an area that is soiled. And we're also in, that's another area for us to look at is um, when something has faded, you know, can we still identify the dye? There are some dyes that will fade away completely, um, but most of the automotive fibers, in my view, we're going to be able to still, even if, let's say, you've got 50% uh, degradation, you're still going to be able to identify the original dye, probably. So uh, that's, that's the next stage for us. So it's a journey. For, for comparison purposes, though, you're interested in wondering whether this is consistent right. with this. And even if it does, if they have faded, we can see chromatographically and mass spectrometrically the degradation products as well as the original dye. So for comparison purposes, a very strong technique. There was another, yes, over here. Uh, for the statistical uh, measurements, I was just curious, are you basing most of the statistical formulas solely on uh, the microspectrometry of the fibers are just the color and dyes, or how much of a fact are you taking in the shape and the, you know, the type of, you know, not the type, but the shape and the size, and what they look like visually? Right. Our original database that was created through an FBI project and then was expanded 900 fibers has PLM, some cross-section data, some, uh, it has denier size, which we obtained from the manufacturers. And um, it has, uh, we don't have IR spectra in that database, but we do have UV vis and fluorescence at four different excitation wavelengths. Um, and then we have the dye information on top of that. So that database is a little bit more complete than I, than I indicated, but I, I think you're right that you know, when you're creating a database, as I was you know, talking about the philosophy of creating databases, make it as informative as possible, um, measure as many relevant characteristics as possible, and include as much variation as possible. And, and how having having uh, recently sold, tur actually turned in an old car in exchange for a new car, it wasn't an even deal, by the way. Um, <laughs> the carpets in that old car were really raunchy. <laughs> they were looking bad. And I, I can imagine that you had some decisions to make in sampling. And, and I'm glad you answered the question, because you said, I think, that you had your students take samples in different places. Well, we took we took maybe a, a square inch cutting, but we tried to we tried to avoid you know areas that were obviously faded, and so we tried to get samples that that weren't um, well they weren't discolored or weren't covered with uh, debris of some type. Um, you know when you when you actually look at the individual fibers, some of them are quite quite dirty. There's a lot of debris and residue on them and so forth. Uh, but most of them are, you know, you've got a lot of sample to work with, so most of them are fine. I might add, I'm going to give uh, a sample of each of my 200 carpet fibers to Steve and let him figure out a way to differentiate them all. <laughs> well, that brings up another question I have. <laughs> and this is, this is really a question for both Hal and for Dave, because when we do microspectrophotometry or infrared analysis, that light beam is only impacting on a little part of that fiber. And, and you know, Dave, you're doing TOF SIMS. What, what is the area that you're looking at? Pretty small, right? Very small. Yeah. And so you know, whenever you're doing microanalysis, you know, the problem is homogeneity, heterogeneity of the material you're looking at and how that impacts the, vari the variability in your results. And more importantly, the generality of any analysis that you do for any particular future sample. So I I'd like to hear something from both of you about those issues. 
That makes sense? You want to go first? <laughs> well, I'm just going to comment. In my experience, especially with really lightly dyed fibers, the orientation of the fiber is also an issue. In other words, if you have a round fiber, there's not an issue. It's going to ori orientate. The orientation is going to be the same. If you have a trilobal fiber, it's going to sit in a lot of different ways. And when you have very little dye present to absorb the radiation, it's going to be scattered. It's going to be refracted and so forth. And, and I think that's an issue in, in your absorption curve. So if you have a trilobal fiber with, with a lobe pointed down and a lobe pointed up, you might see differences in the absorption curve just because of the orientation. And I don't know, I'm not sure about the different uh, spots on the fiber, but um, you, do get, you do get variation. I'm not sure if it's due to concentration differences or what. So is it if the Michelin man is standing up or laying down? <laughs> I th Michelin man is, because it is so variable, um, it's hard to get two fibers exactly orientated mm -hmm. the same way. But I've done studies where I've taken a regular trilobal with a, with a lobe, with a center lobe down in the center of the fiber and with a center lobe up. And you do get differences in the absorption curve. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, great question, Steve. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the things that, well, we looked at two, two different areas. One is, can you see the dye? Can you see that it's present? Um, and that's, that's going to be less susceptible to variations within a, a fabric. Uh, generally speaking, fabrics are dyed relatively uniformly, but of course, if you've got a really small area, you're going to see variability. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, if we're going to try and say this much dye is present in a particular fiber, uh, I think we're going down the road of being able to say, say that, at least with dispersed dyes in polyester. But then is that how representative is that from the rest of the fabric? Um, that's a great point. Um, you, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Yes. <clears throat> answer what Hal was saying about the dichroic effects of the fiber, depending on its orientation. There's a paper about to be published, if it's not already been published, in Science and Justice, dealing with that very issue and how to discriminate fibers based upon their dichroic behavior. Uh, it's uh, by Christoval of the Belgian lab. Uh, I don't have the uh, reference, I, mean, I can't remember if it's been published or something. It's out right now. It's the current. Uh, Science and Justice Journal uh, is out, and they were looking at some lightly dyed uh, fibers that visually there was no dichroism, but when they actually measured dichroism with the polarized light microspectrophotometry, the ratios were on the order of four. So they were very, some of the highest dichroic racial fibers were ones that were visually consistent and actually they thought well, were not that growth at all. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. I actually have another question. I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you. Um, when you were looking at the cross section of the fibers and they were in a resin, how are you actually focusing the beam on your fiber and not the resin? Um, it's just got a uh, very high, what it does is uh, it'll uh, raster over a whole area and then you search for um, the particular ions and it just picks up all the ions in that region. So there is a component, you know, it's possible that the, those ions could be present in the resin, but you select the ions specific, and that would be a problem if that was the case. So, um, so you exclude those ions that are, that are a component of the resin. And of course, if you had any smearing or anything like that, you might find the dye present in the resin and things like that. So there is some background level noise which you have to exclude, which, we, which I believe we did by uh, normalizing against uh, other uh, iron content. Other questions? Well, I'd like to close by thanking all of the speakers from the early session today and all of the speakers from this session. And uh, I'd like to thank you. This, is a, this has been such a wonderful meeting. I think professionally, as trace evidence practitioners, you're very fortunate to have the National Institute of Justice and the FBI be able to sponsor these meetings every year because it's, it's an absolutely wonderful venue to have such a uh, 
an opportunity to learn and to exchange ideas. So uh, this has been um, uh, just an excellent, excellent meeting. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of the meeting.